Well, uh, thank you for that nice round of applause. Uh, I have to say, I'm, I'm very excited to, to be here uh, and speak to you about um, the role of artificial intelligence in, in drug development. But I also wanted to reflect a little bit on uh, natural technologies and how those are augmenting um, are being augmented by, by the work that we're doing in, um, in artificial intelligence. So what do I mean by, by natural technologies? These are the, uh, the technologies that are innate within all of us. That nice round of applause that you gave to me um, required a, a tremendous number, a billion or more chemical reactions. Uh, it required neuro and muscular and visual and auditory cues uh, to, to make that happen. And of those billions of chemical reactions, these are just some of the, let's say, uh, rounding up to the nearest uh, 10 thousands, it's 40,000 billion billion chemical reactions that take place in our body every second. You know, so this is, this is a very complex machine. Uh, and the data that those are that are being created by that uh, dwarfs the amount of data that exists today. I read recently that there's 146 zettabytes of information uh, that exists, and it's just kind of put that in perspective. One single zettabyte, uh, if it were the size of a grain of rice, would be enough to fill the entire Pacific Ocean from 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 top to bottom. So so. Mechanistically, we are very complex, and we're going to get to hear uh, from, from Bob a little bit later, who has an absolutely fascinating company looking at, at uh, the, the Gen X and, and the Gen X of how those are going to be applied. And I think of us from, from a data storage perspective, uh, again, looking at this complexity, if you look at the, at the genetics, the building blocks uh, of our lives uh, and, uh, and, and what gives us our form and function. Uh, stored in our DNA, if we were to take that DNA from all of our cells, string it together and stretch it out, it would go from here to the sun and back 50 times. So this is, this is big data on an enormous scale. And we have to begin to look at ways to unpack all of that information to make it meaningful. Um, so I spoke a little bit about uh, the work that's happening uh, with our 3.7 trillion cells. Uh, 100 billion of these are our neurons. This is what allows us to, to move and interact with the world around us. Uh, and to begin to look at this creativity, uh, to begin to look at this, we've needed to create new technologies that help us unlock that. It's just too much information. Uh, I also read recently that 90% of the world's data was created within the last two years. Digital data was created within the last two years. This is astounding. Uh, but only 1% of it has been analyzed. And when you have that sort of mismatch between humanity's ability to generate information and our ability to analyze and give it meaning is where we've needed to create technologies to help us. Uh, and, and the reason why uh, is because we are fragile. We're fragile animals. We may be complex, uh, we may be creative, but yet we are fragile. We're perhaps uh, one, one, one phone call away, one skiing accident, uh, from realizing, remembering that actually our health is our greatest asset. Human health is that ubiquitous thing that kind of holds us all together. Uh, and if we're gonna generate a technology that's gonna help break down some of those barriers, allow us to understand the way our body works in, in greater detail, it seems sensible to me that we create a technology that enables that. Uh, and, and, it's a, and it's a good thing, too. Uh, you know, we heard that uh, our, our healthcare is rising to uh, 10 trillion within the next several years. It's hard to look around this room and say, well, actually, we, we have, we have an existential, existential crisis to our healthcare, but in fact, we do. Um, and, and if you look to where this is meant to rise over the next decade or so, this is meant to rise to about 17 trillion. So this is the entire gross domestic product of the United States. We will begin to collapse under the weight of our own healthcare system. Uh, and as we heard earlier uh, as well, some of the, the inefficiencies, the productivity challenges that we have in the pharmaceutical space, and this is an area that, that I know fairly well, it costs 2.5 billion to develop a drug to treat a disease. Uh, and that's not because that's how much our clinical trials cost. It's because of all the failure 
that goes on around that. It takes 10 years or so to develop a drug. Uh, and how can we live in a day, you know, here it is, 2019, where we have 97.5% of anything failing, but that actually is what's happening in drug discovery. 97.5% of all drug development fails. So we need to do something more because that means that patients uh, and caregivers uh, are not able to provide the treatment for patients that, uh, that, that is necessary. Um, having all this information is only part of it, right? We, we need to contextualize it. We need to know what it means in the context of everything else. You can't just put a whole bunch of information and think that it's going to make sense. Uh, and it, and it, it reminds me of a statistical correlation between um, drowning and ice cream sales. Right? And we as humans, we get that. We get that right away. Right? In the summertime, it's warm. Uh, we go swimming. Uh, we also may eat ice cream. Uh, but if, if, we're not, if we're not mindful of that, we may create a technology that makes assumptions, such as eating ice cream or ice cream sales lead to drowning. So we need to be careful about that. But there's also another challenge around that. I wish if you could just help me out with a little bit of, of, of easy mathematics. Um, could you add those two numbers together? Yes. yes. So it's a thousand forty, a one thousand forty. Uh, two thousand forty. Three thousand seventy. Three thousand ninety. Yes, we have one right answer in that. <laughs> um, it's uh, it's 4,100, right? Most people will say 5,000, right? Because we make that assumption, right? We're presumptive uh, as humans. And there's the balance, right? We, we have a technology that can't contextualize things unless we develop it, but we ourselves are fallible. Uh, and it reminds me also, and you may remember this, this fable, uh, this is four, blindfolded uh, men and women uh, who are holding uh, an elephant, but they don't know that, right? Because they're, they're blindfolded. And they're each asked to describe the portion of that elephant that they're holding. So the person in the front uh, who's holding the, 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 the tusk uh, says, I'm holding a spear. Uh, and the woman who's, well, not in that picture, the man who's holding uh, the leg thinks that he's holding a, a tree trunk. Uh, the woman who's pushing up against the, uh, the side thinks she's pushing up against the wall. Uh, and um, the, the person at the far end who, I guess in this photograph, is a little bit like Donald Trump, thinks that he's <laughs> holding a rope, right? But none of them say elephant, right? Because they can't contextualize all that. They're siloed. And that's one of the challenges that we have with data today. And you can take this metaphor maybe a bit further and understand that maybe that person is a pediatrician. Maybe that person is an oncologist. Maybe that person uh, is a data scientist. And, and, and by not working together, they're missing the bigger picture, right? And this is where technology allows us to come in a little bit more, the kind of the, the machine intelligence piece of it. It's looking at things that we do really well and augmenting those by things that machines do very well. Uh, and you know, earlier I, I said 100 billion, those are the number of neurons. Uh, in, in our head, uh, and if I look at, at benevolent system as an example, our neural network has about 100 billion neurons in it as well, and we can add more neurons uh, into the network if we want to, but it begins to diverge into areas that that provide extraordinary advantages over humans, okay? It has digital recollection. It's able to remember every word from every sentence of every paragraph of every paper, every clinical trial, every database, every genomic database, every chemistry database that it ever sees, right? And it's able to contextualize that. It's able to contextualize that in hyperdimensional space, so a thousand dimensions. We as humans aren't even capable, biologically capable, of understanding what it's like to think in more than four dimensions. Right? We just don't, we're, we're not engineered that way. Biologically, we cannot do that. 
uh, the way that it's able to, to store this information. It has 160 million variables that it can store in its head simultaneously. I can barely hold five, right? So it has advantages over what, what we have. It learns on its own, right? It's taught itself biology by, by reading textbooks uh, and reading papers and understanding it. It's taught itself chemistry by reading and understanding chemistry and it updates itself every day by reading 10,000 new publications, right? An average scientist reads somewhere between 200 and 400 papers per year. Imagine being able to read everything every night. It's not as smart as a human, it's not even close, but it makes up for things in volume and it makes up for things in, in, um, in its ability to remember those things. Uh, and, and because that information is exponential, right? It's not additive, it's exponential, right? If, if I asked you to walk 30 steps, you would walk about 30 meters. If I asked you to walk 30 exponential steps, you'd walk around the earth 26 times. So these are vastly different things that are happening. Um, and we heard a little bit more uh, about, about AI as a, uh, as a diagnostic tool. These are the things that are, are more in the public press. You know, there was a group at, at Harvard, as an example, uh, who looked at a, a specific type of, of breast cancer and tried to learn whether or not it's able to, to choose those characteristics. And it's able to accurately do that with 92% accuracy uh, compared to a human in this particular one of 87% accuracy. So it's superhuman in its ability to do that. But I think the really interesting piece of this is actually when you put those two things together, when you put the human together with the machine, that accuracy goes up to 99.5% accurate. So the deficiencies that human have are made up by the machine, and the deficiencies that the machine have is made up by the human. So that 99. I think it's 99.7 actually, but that, that, that high degree of accuracy means that more patients are able to be diagnosed uh, and, and therefore treated. Of course, it doesn't begin to look at if you're diagnosed with something, do you have a cure for that, okay? That's, that's, that's where uh, collectively we're, we're moving our technology. It's, it's the technology that Bob's building. It's the technology that, that we're building and others are building to help address these needs. Um, augmented by machines, we can achieve more. I just gave an example of that. And it's hard to really understand where our technology is going to be going. Uh, I, I sat in a talk with, with Bill Gates in January this year, and he said something that was really interesting, is people will overestimate the impact of technology over the next two years. And it will vastly underestimate the impact of technology over the next 10 years. Right? My iPhone didn't exist in 2008, but look at how diverse and how, how much utility. I don't know, mine's sitting right there, but I know exactly where it is. But if I didn't have it, I would be pretty stressed out about it, right? Because my, it's running many aspects of my life. Uh, and in the same way, um, many people think of machine intelligence, maybe the machine intelligence revolution, looking at a comparison to the industrial age, right? It's not my analogy, it's, it's Andrew McAfee, who's a professor of mathematics uh, at, at MIT. And he likened this to the industrial revolution where, where, where that technology infinitely increased the power of our bodies, our muscles. We could do much more than we were previously able to do. And in the same way, it is, it is his, his thesis, it is many people's thesis, including my own, that this sort of machine intelligence is going to be making an impact in infinitely making more, democratizing more, the ability of our brains to work much better uh, by having those augmented. So thank you very much. <laughs>